I can see them real well. And that's how I do it. I print them out. But I don't have time to do that right now. Um, but I can bring uh, to Kerr if you want. Right. I'll mute everybody except Jim. Okay. I'll talk to everybody later. I hope you uh, can understand that it, my vision is really not that good. This one looks pink and that one looks blue. And they look <laughs> to me like, uh, they both look like uh, you yell or something close to them. Are they supposed to be Arcturians? Oh yeah, they could be Arcturians. I can't see the shoulders. That's the distinguishing feature for me on the Arcturians. They have a triangular kind of shape sometimes. Um, have you ever okay. seen darker ones kind, like almost a purplish? There's all kinds of Octorians out okay, there. Yeah. I, the ones that I've encountered in my images and my own visions have been like almost a dark, almost purple. You know, in Octorian space, there's a lot of different kinds of Octorians. Mm -hmm. And they're not specified. We need their... They're specific names. It's just like Pleiadians. Their Pleiadian space is a big area. Right. Well, I guess and that's like calling us humans, and yet we're all... Like, so we need to get the categorizations, because those are two different kinds of Octorians, but yet they're both Octorians. So, all righty then. I will bring to Kerr. Thank you. Oh, so just to give uh, some of you guys a heads up, I'm also doing a channeling session right, right now. So just letting you know that you know, I'm recording it and I will send it to you when, after I'm done. Anyone else want to talk to or ask them? Thank you. Greetings. I am Takur. Greetings. Uh, hi, Takur. Welcome. Ah, I hear Max's voice, but I do not see his face. Can you see the blue and orangish uh, images of Arc Arcturians on the screen? Very lightly. They're, they're very uh, pastel colored. Right, they are. Um, do you mind commenting what species are these? These are Arcturians. And the orange one is the one which is part of, part of Gurkvitnir? One moment. Let me look a little closer. They are both, uh, uh, there are parts of both of these species in Gurkvitnir. It is a group that is called Arcturian group, but there are several different kinds of looking Arcturians in this group at least three different kinds anyway. And both of these are within the uh, group that we are, are here with. Uh, can you ask them if they can give us the names for these orange and blue ones? You mean the, a different name other than Octorian? Yeah, just sub, subspace, subs... Mm. A subtitle yes, on sub Somebody. One moment, and I will speak to them. Just a moment. They will ask them, and she will get back to me. I asked Sengi to get with them. Wonderful, thank you. So last time, uh, for the for the book, we asked you to. Tell us about the origins of Liran race. Um, and you mentioned that you wanted also to speak about the culture of, of Lirans and maybe other things. The cultures and the rituals. I do not know if I spoke about any of the cultures or the rituals, did I? Not yet. 
there are some there are different cultures of Lyrans, and now they are even more diverse because they have been scattered all over the galaxies and some have of course taken all the traditions with them but maybe have picked up or dropped some of the uh early or earlier or more ancient portions of the traditions due to the fact that they are evolving or they feel that it's no longer meaningful uh or something of that nature but there are the different feasts Yes, you have feasts on your planet as well, but our feasts are for uh, the remembrance of different occasions, just as yours are. But they are a little different. Uh, they would include only one certain particular kind of food for each kind of feast. There are three different feast days in what we call, or what you would call, a year. So we, we have one at the beginning of the year, and that would take in the kinds of foods that will be grown in that part of the year at the center of the planet. You see, the center of the planet, around the center area, is where most of the crops and, and things that uh, of natural or organic origin are from. And so, but they do have different See three different seasons. You have four different seasons on your planet. Uh, the your equator though only has uh, one or two seasons, I believe. But on our planet, the equatorial area has about three seasons because of the warble of our pl our uh, planet or, or the original planet, I should say. It was in a an elliptical um, rotation around our suns, and it uh, provided different uh, seasons for uh, that central part of the, and for the entire planet. Uh, the first season was the cooler of the seasons. It was not not a hot, cold. It wasn't wintry like any of your seasons but it was cooler, and this provided more of the sebion. The sebion were the fruit groups, and they, so the first feast is about the fruit, the fruit groups, and it is at the end of the season when the harvest is taking place. The fruit group would have its own kind of festival, and all the different foods that were made from these fruits would be what was eaten. No other kind of food would be eaten at that time because we were celebrating that harvest. This is, remember, this is from the original planet of Lyra. The second, the second feast time was about uh, two thirds of the year with, uh, about another third of the year within. And this was, the Sembion group. The Sembion group was more of the meat group or the animal group. And so therefore they celebrated with only eating the, of the animals that were plentiful at that time. You see, that was the mating period at the, at the end of the food, fruit group. Then they started the animal group, which was the mating season for them. And that is when we celebrate Symbion uh, group, and that was mostly what they ate in that festival, in that feast. And then the final group was more of the vegetable group, the Kalika group. The Kalika group was when more vegetables were grown than any other time. Of course, there is intermingling of these different things happening all at once. They, it wasn't that just fruit than just animals and then just uh, vegetables. However, that is the f the majority of the festival was with these three groups. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yes, thank so you. That, yes. So therefore, the three different kinds of fruit groups were celebrated uh, during the year. Now, I'm, I know that you have dairy groups and other groups in your culture and stuff and things stuff. <laughs>
But anyway, um, we did not celebrate those because they were year round uh, things that we uh, had all year round. And the, the foods that were all year round were actually not celebrated in their own right. But the ones that were seasonal were celebrated because we felt uh, fortunate to be able to have those particular crops at that time. And that came from the ancient Lyran. Also, the many traditions about uh, unions and marriage have changed over the years. Uh, weddings have changed just as your, in your culture, uh, getting married has changed in several different ways. And our final, the, the final stage of that was that we became um, not communal, but semi-communal in the sense that uh, different parts of the family, of course, were separated, but yet it was very free and open that we were very close together and that we celebrated the family in many ways. The times of birth and the times of death, the times when uh, children reach maturity or when someone was ill or things of this nature, there was always the semi-community took care of these particular situations. Now you may say, we go to the doctor for our uh, needs when it comes to illnesses, but uh, in our culture, we have evolved to take care of our own uh, illnesses and needs in that regard. There is always one person in the community that will take care of all the uh, illnesses of the family. Now, you may run into some families that have died out or ha are down to just a few members. And sometimes those, uh, those small family units are adopted by a larger family unit. And that is also fine and very much acceptable. Is there any questions about that? Yes. I know that that's very yes. general. Yes, thank you. Uh, last time you mentioned that um, you are a peaceful race. Uh, so can you specifically tell about the, you know, the wars which you participated and what's what part of the, well, the culture original, is? The original reptilian confrontation was the the war that we refused to fight and so left the planet and the planet was destroyed however with that we had resolved as a people that we were not going to fight them because this would just um, create a greater war and a greater source of aggression in the galaxy and so instead of fighting the reptilians, we left. Now, because of that, it made us even more peaceful in the sense that we felt we had done the right thing. And we felt very proud of ourselves in the sense that there was no negative actions taken. And so I do not know about all the species of Lyrans that have gone forth from that time. But I know that our area, the ones that from our area that have moved forward and made this planet and lived on several other worlds have been always very peaceful and have always been very friendly. I know that we have not always been met friend, as friends by other species, but soon after we arrive or let them know who we are, they understand. News of us travels far. We are a very peaceful civilization. Probably, I do not know of another species that has not been involved in many wars. Our earliest, earliest uh, development had some negativity to it on the planet, but once we realized that that was not working for us as a planet. You see, we came together as a planet and not separate areas. Somehow we were able to maintain contact with each other over, over time and space on this planet and able to get together and 
communicate peacefully with one another. And even if there was a disagreement, it would come to, for, we would not rest until it was uh, taken care of. And so this is how we have always managed. All that I can remember is that if there was a disagreement in the family or between families or even between planets, we would not rest until it had been resolved. And if their idea was to fight, then we would move on. We would say, no, that's fine. We will, we will take our things and move away. We are not going to fight for the planet, for ground, for matter. We do not find that to be, um, it, it does not work for us. Because then, the ma then what you have fought for is tainted. Does that make sense to you? Yes, so there is no professional warriors among Lirans, right? We do not bring up warriors. We bring up our people to be, our children to be peaceful and to talk to our people in peaceful manners. That does not mean we do not have disagreements or there is not some trouble at some places because people have a tendency to disagree and want what they want. However, it is always compromised or always met in one way or another. We do have a council that if things get too far out of hand, we take it to the council and they will make the final decision. And then the people will live with that because they realize that the, the council is made up of wise men and women and they will live with the decision even though they may not agree with it. But it usually never gets that far out of hand. What is the type of government you have? We have, there is a government, there is a council. Mm -hmm. um, that is the, the, the central form of our government. They, we usually govern our own family units ourselves without any problems because there is always someone in the family that is designated for for keeping peace or more than one. There's always a, someone for medical purposes. There is, it's all, the family is a self-contained government in some cases, because many families are very large. And so we have our own little uh, way of dealing things within our family units and communities. Uh -huh. uh, but if things get out of hand, it is taken to the council. Uh if you look at the human society, what uh, parts of human culture, what countries are most resembling Liran? What uh, governmental structures would be most Liran? We do not see any particular um, area on your planet that reminds us of ourselves, except for certain religious areas, such as the Tibetan monks or the monks, the um, uh, Franciscan monks, very peaceful, very quiet to themselves, a community, but yet very self-contained. They do not usually go out of these areas for much, except for maybe purchasing things that they may need. You see, we don't have the money unit here, so we barter with other clans and other communities for things that we may need that are important. And of course, they are all around, and we do intermingle um, during festival times. I understand, thank you. I have several more questions, but before going with the questions, I wanted to uh, let Khan ask his questions. Yes. Hello, take care, my friend. Greetings, Khan. I have some drawings for you. Can you, do you have any comments on that? I, I did not hear the question. Do you have any comments uh, about my drawings? I am sharing. Now. I love your drawings. They show many different species in di many different uh, areas of the, the galaxies. This particular picture is of a Lyran, uh, descent it's not from our uh, particular area of space this is from um, I, the Alpha Centaurian area they have 
Lyrans that look more like this because they grew up on a planet uh, that was not as similar to Lyran as, I mean, more similar to Lyran than what we grew up with. And so they remained looking very similar to the ancient Lyrans from the past. This is what more of an ancient look. Uh, we have adapted and have um, evolved into a, a shorter haired species with smaller tails and different things because of where we have lived and the different atmospheres that we have lived in over the millennia. But we still have some of the same facial features, of course. Yes. This looks like, let me see it for sure. It looks like uh, a, almost a reptilian, but I cannot see the face, the mouth area. Okay. Ah, oh, yes, it's, it's, this is um, Andromedan. This is a species from Andromeda. The, it's similar to the Eliashon Dizendi, but not exactly. They're, they're a race that has probably come from the roots of their, from the roots of their descendants. But very similar. The, the Eliashon Dizendi are, have bigger muzzles, sharper teeth, and are, look a little bit more reptilian than that. Ah, another of the Lyran species from Alpha Centauri. Okay. I, I'm wondering if they changed any part of their name. I think they still go by Lyrans. And also, yes, Lyran as well, definitely. This reminds me of uh, the species of Lyran that is in... Um, the Octorian space now, far behind that actually, it's Ellie Condo space. Ellie Condo space, they have a species of the Lyran that looks very much like this. Uh, Jim, what, uh, Takur, what is your species, subspecies name? We, are, we call ourselves Lyran as well. Many of those that came from the planet Lyra and are, have their ancient roots there, call themselves Lyran. Now, there might be a few groups that have changed their names uh, slightly, but I do not know what that would be. Do you have a name of, of, of a variety of Lyrans, which you are? The Alcondo Lyrans. And the Alpha Centauri in there, they usually take on their uh, galaxy name. But uh, you, which is your race, uh, Takur's race? Takur's race is called Lyrans from Pleiadia. The Pleiadians, okay. yes. Okay. Now this is, this looks like a priestess or a priest from the Lyran culture in the ancient days. They would wear the, the third eye symbol, which did glow like this. This reminds me, this is an ancient uh, Lyran picture. I'm not sure if there's anything like this around at this time. Did you, Khan, I have a question. Did you pick this up in your recent thought processes as it being existing today? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm thinking your race like this, but I feel it looks ancient. Yes, I, yeah, I feel it it's ancient. Yes. It does look ancient to me. It looks like uh, from the original planet of Lyra. This is a picture that we have. I have a picture very similar to this in some of my ancient history books about ancient history. And this looks like a priest or a priestess from that ancient era when Lyra was still around as a planet. Okay. So, uh, Lyra's first planet called Eden or something else? I, I did not hear you. Lyra, what's the Lyra first planet? It's called Eden. 
I still, you're breaking up a little, and I did not. I can someone understand, understand his question? The name of the first uh, Lyran planet was it Eden? E D E N. Eden. Yeah. Yes, there. Some called it that. Yes, because that is what the reptilians perceived it as. It, e D E N. Eden. Yes. Many perceived it as an Eden because it was so peaceful. It was blessed by God in many ways. And the reptilians thought that God was cheating them out of something. And so that's why they fought with us. They wanted to destroy this planet because they thought it was an unfair representation of life in the galaxy. Yes, this is, that is a reptilian species. It, yes, from the Andromedan area also. A lot of, of reptilians came from the Andromedan area. There are other areas, of course, that they have uh, uh, branched out into, but the earliest areas of, Dra uh, of draconians and reptilians were in uh, the Andromeda areas. This, yes, go ahead. It's hard for me to see that with his eyes. But yes, also in the Andromedan area, that is. Very difficult to see. This is a different species. That is, I'm sure you would probably think that it's Octorian, but it's not. It is an earlier version of Yu Yil. Notice the blue eyes. Octorians rarely have blue eyes. Their eyes, they can be blue, but they're more silvery blue, a lighter color of blue than this, or they're lavender, or they're silver or they're very light, very, very light colors. This is a deep, deeper blue. And so this is an early Yu-Gi-Oh look. Okay. Yu-Gi-Oh developed into a very human looking creature eventually and looked very much human at this time. That is hard to see. I'm, I'm trying to draw this like a sun being. Yes, I cannot really, it's not, I can't focus on it well enough to tell you what that is. There's a lot of things in the background. Is that a sun? Yes, sun being. I, I'm thinking that. A sun being, yes, there are beings in the sun. Let me tell you that the older the sun is, the more chance that it will have a sentient life form within it especially red dwarfs and suns that are very, very ancient, have life within them, and they keep their suns alive as much as they can, of course. But when they do supernova, they do take that opportunity to return to the oversoul. However, um, some sun beings, you... Um, are very advanced. But I cannot tell you really, we do, it's hard to communicate with them. They do not speak a language that is translatable, at least at this point, or at least well translatable. We can understand a few things because they try to speak our languages, the galactic language. But um, other than that, they are, very mysterious. We do not know what they are, how they live, or anything of that nature. They, we, it is impossible to know. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Take care for all questions and answers. You're welcome. And thank you, Khan. Wonderful images. Um, Dakur, um, do you mind if I continue with my questions? You may ask more. Thank you. So, um, how many Lirans, how many Liran individuals are involved with the 
solar system project. You mean in Gurkvik near? Anywhere. Uh, with Gurkvik near, there is about uh, one million eight hundred thousand lirans involved with Gurkvik near. Wow. One million. Actually, that's a small, small number. That's actually a small number. There are many, there's billions of Lyrans in the galaxies and universe, but about 1.8 million are involved with this project, yes. Wow. Uh, can you um, comment on uh, how is Lyran family different from human family? Well, we're much more communal. Your family seem to be very separated. There are very few family units that we have studied on your planet that are close, very, very close. And if they are very close, there's only a four or five of them that are in the unit. For us, the community is maybe 50, 60, 90, 1,000. We can have some very large family units that can be like a whole city. And we can make up our own governments and laws and things that run very well. But other, for your human family, it seems very small. The family units are very, very small. All right. Um, in many cases, very disjointed. They do not eat meals together. They do not um, talk together a lot. In fact, there's a lot of fighting. It seems like there's a lot of anger with most families, at least when the children reach adolescence. When our children reach adolescence, this is a time for um, separation. They separate themselves in, uh, in a different way than your children do. They separate themselves to learn about what, they're, what is happening to them and why they are feeling uh, different changes in the body and things of that nature. It's a very short separation. It's like uh, one of your classrooms for about three or four weeks. And then they come out of that and are, they are very aware of all the things that may, they may feel, they may uh, want, they may desire. And it makes for a much more peaceful transition into adulthood rather than dealing with um, culture and um, society all at once and not knowing the answers. How many children uh, do Lyrans usually get, like in one birth? Is it like, like kittens, many kittens at once? That was an ancient form of birthing had three or four at one time. But in this day and age, it is possible for that to still happen. However, for the most part, it is only one or two. Do they uh, do you breastfeed them? Yes, there is. We do have natural feeding ways that for the first six weeks of their life. And the Lyran still give live births, not technological. Well, that, it, your births are not technological, right? You, you, the Lyrans are born um, naturally, right? Yes, but there is technology that helps with pain and things of that nature. And they are very easy births for the most part. We found that the less traumatic a birth is, the greater chance for a child to be happier in the first several years of their life. Uh, do you have uh, two genders? Yes, male and female, just as you. Can males give birth? No, males cannot. I see. There are some species where male and female are interactive in that way that males can give birth, but they usually are not a humanoid species. Um, how much technology is in your daily life? In a typical Liran family, would you have lots of technology? Yes and no. Let me, let me describe that. 
In my work, yes, I have a lot of technology because I need it to help me to move information quickly from one place to another. But in the family life, yes, there is technology that helps us to clean and keep the habitats very uh, clean. And there are places, times where we have uh, cooking help with technology and things of that nature. However, and when we do reading or things of that nature, but when we do exercise or are working out, it's more natural. We found that machinery does not um, recreate nature as well as natural movement. Wonderful. How much uh, of uh, life is around you? Do you have like plants and gardens and things of that sort? Of course. Plants and gardens and things of this nature are interests to many of our people. Some people, that is what they do with their life, is they dedicate it to the study of plants or animals or culturally uh, bringing food into the world through plants or animals or things of this nature. But it is something that it's a, a specialty. If you do something of this nature, it takes much time. And they are given over to many hours a day of just working with these things. Usually, if you are someone that does plants or animals, you're working with them maybe in your time, maybe a 10-hour day. Thank you. Um, how psychic are the lyrics? Uh, do you all, are you all telepathic or you all in fourth dimension, right? Yes, we are fourth dimensional. We are telepathic. And many of us do have psychic language, meaning that we talk to each other without actually speaking. Now, the reason we do speak is for the, the politeness to our fellow creatures that do not have telepathy or do not have uh, psychic languages, such as the friendly reptilians, and uh, some of the Yuyil do not have psychic languages uh, as of yet, but uh, many of the others do. But the thing is, uh, psychic language can still be misunderstood if you do not speak the language of that particular species. So we use galactic language and speak out loud most of the time. Thank you. Um, do you have telekinetic abilities? Telekinetic abilities have been, um, what is the word? Nurtured in some of our people. We do not, we do not actually like telekinetic abilities. They can get out of control. Let me explain what I mean. The area of the brain that controls telekinesis is, can be automatic, if you know what I mean. It can actually become automatic and you can start doing things automatically, telekinetically, like moving one thing here to there and not even uh, being aware of what you're doing. It becomes very disruptive. If you're in a group of people that have telekinetic energies and they're all trying to do something telekinetically, you may have a little bit of a disaster on your hands. Things crashing into each other and people moving things that shouldn't be moved. And, and we did go through a, a strong period where telekinesis was uh, a new thing and it was developed, but then it socially it became something of a disruption. And so now it's only used in certain areas for certain rituals and for certain uh, meaningful activities. It is not used in everyday life. Thank you, that helps. Do you use teleportation, natural teleportation? We use teleportation, yes. Teleportation is a much faster and easier way to move from one part of the ship to the other 
from moving from one planet to another, from one area to another. Um, it's it's very much easier now, especially since it's at a, in its advanced stages, which means that it's not a new it's a, not a new technology. The very earliest forms of transporting were very dangerous at times because they were not uh, precise enough. And things could happen, uh, not always, but every now and then, a really terrible accident could happen with transportation if energies were disrupted or whatever. So now they have it so that energies cannot be disrupted within these particular devices and it remains constant. And so when the energy remains constant, it's a much safer apparatus. Um, my question was actually about natural teleportation. As I understand, Yael can naturally teleport and appear in different places. Do you have the same quality? This is, a, this is an astral teleportation. They can bilocate. Right. Uh, which means that they can actually appear in two places at once. And they have developed this because of, they are very empathic creatures. They have developed this because of their empathic way. Empathy has made teleport uh, by location easier. Let me explain that. The first forms of by location that are experienced are when someone else is in trouble. Someone bilocates to them to help them. Or if someone is dying, they bilocate the, to them to, to be with them. The Yu-Yil have this em, incredible empathic ability so that they can feel what is happening in their world and within their families. And this allows them to bilocate easier than other species because of their empathy. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So therefore, they have developed a greater sensibility about bilocation than any other species that I know because of that. Now, not that other species don't bilocate because they do, but uh, the uh, Yu-Yil are probably the best at it. They can actually bilocate to more than one place at a time if there happens to be a need for it. Uh-huh. So you are not bilocating. Are, I do not bilocate. I mean, you as a, as a species. Our species, there are some on our species, in our species that can bilocate, yes. But um, it is a developed talent or skill. And it is something we have to work on. It is not something that is natural to us, like it is with the UEL. I see. Um, when you're born as a species, like when a Lyran is born, uh, how much of the past life is transferred to the new child? How much of the past experience is there? Do you remember your past lives? No, not immediately, no. It is the same with any child that is born that we have studied that the child is born rather like a blank page. And I believe that is the way God intended, because you think about it. If you were to be born with all kinds of information in your head, would it not create problems immediately? Um, I believe that learning who you are and learning about your surroundings is much better than having it forced upon you in your thought processes and actually can be wrong because you may be recalling a past life incidents from some of somewhere else and it not be fitting into your present life and it would cause psychosis. So no, you must come into life. We feel as a blank sheet of paper, so to speak, and learn about what is around you and where you are and why you are. Instead of having all that information thrust upon you immediately, it would be maddening. Just think about it. But when would you normally become aware of your past lives? When your chakras ignite, mm -hmm. 
When you discover that you know who you are and you, you are understanding of the physicality of your body, you're understanding that your body has spirit and life and uh, there is a God presence, then the chakras ignite. And then you can discover more things about your spirituality through past life revelations. But you cannot understand past life revelations or past life experiences without a spiritual understanding of some sort. Yes. Uh, do Lirans normally communicate with their past lives and the personalities of the past lives? We find there is a couple of our rituals that include uh, connecting with past lives, yes. That's not the daily routine, right? No, it is not. But it is something that is very special to us. I see. Uh, is your idea of reincarnation is uh, one soul goes from a life to another life to another life, or is more branching there? Is there a free choice between... Can you choose a past life in the, in the life, in the adult life? Can you uh, choose a new past life? There, there are species that can do that. We cannot choose it and go there at, at will, but the Chikani can. We cannot, but we understand that it is something that we will evolve to be able to do. Let me explain my question. It is, it is sophisticated, basically, as I understand, you can create your past. So can you create a past life? We can, but it is forbidden by the timekeepers. I see. Uh, I have several more questions, but uh, I would let uh, Wendy go first. Wendy, are Hi, you there? Hi, Chakur, yes, thank you for coming. Can you hear me all right? I hear you perfectly. Okay, great, thank you very much. I was just wondering, are you guys still, do you guys still use process? I mean, can you, have you evolved to the point where you can instantly manifest? Um, and if so, do you still use process or? We are only fourth dimensional. We cannot uh, recreate by thought, if that's what you mean. Okay, we yes. We can't recreate by technology. Yes, we have, uh, we have developed technology that can recreate many things and clone and things of this nature. Some of these things are, we do not use very often because of the nature of the outcome of them. However, we cannot uh, manifest things and have it appear in front of us. But technologically, we can do that. I but understand. I organically, understand. we cannot. And do you still use um, things like we do to enhance your experience, such as sense, clothing, um, aromatherapy, yeah. meditation? Well, I know you do meditation. We find that, yes, we find that uh, clothing is essential for uh, protocol in many situations. And we find that um, meditation, prayer, and things of this nature do enhance the lifestyle that we want to lead and is ne necessary for us to continue to grow in the sense that, yes, you can learn things and we can intellectually grow, but there is a spiritual aspect to each individual. And for that to grow, we need that meditation, prayer, understanding, and learning of what spirituality is and how to control it in some ways because their uh, telekinesis, as we spoke of before, has a spiritual element to it and can be of negative or positive control and can be automatically controlled negatively or positively. And so therefore, we, that's why we limit the learning of it and the use of it. It cannot... Uh, if someone has developed it automatically or on their birth or whatever, sometimes it is necessary for us to go in and uh, remove that talent or remove that skill because it becomes dangerous to not only themselves but others. 
and it is spiritually motivated at points. Yes, I understand that. So you do, so you do still, do, are you already then, um, we, we as humans strive to understand our multi multidimensionality and our, right. and our, our lack of separation. Are you, are you already aware completely of your multidimensionality that you don't still have the challenges that we do, that we are facing and realizing that you know, we are not individuals necessarily, but a part of a whole? Yeah. Believe me that, yes, we do realize our multidimensionality. And believe me, that creates more questions than answers. <laughs> yes, I completely understand and it, that. <laughs> and that creates more problems than it does solutions. Yes. So therefore, um, yes, we do understand our multidimensionality. We do understand how to, do, to manipulate some forms of dimensions especially moving backwards in dimensional thoughts. But mm. moving forward is much more difficult because you have the blockages, the, the, uh, the realm separations, if you will. And believe me, understanding the dimensions brings more questions than it does answers. And it also changes how you think about your dimension and how you think about who you are in your dimension, because you want to be moving steadily forward, but yet you see that each dimension will bring greater questions and greater challenges to move forward. I completely understand that I am experiencing that very thing myself. Um, so thank you, actually, I yes. needed to hear that. Um, do you, how many of you, I, I was surprised to know how many are included in, in the Gurk Vicknir um, project. I, I was completely astounded. How many of you are actually communicating with us tele, uh, telepathically or through the light languages then? I'm thinking, I'm wondering, I'm there thinking is it's a, more than I thought. No, there's a select group that is allowed to communicate with the earth. Let me, let me explain. There are so many Lirans, so many Yugil, so many of this and that, because they need to keep control of the information that's coming to the planet. If they had random people just doing channelings to the Earth, then the information would be even more confusing than it is already. There is so much information heading toward the Earth from so many locations that it is very confusing for many. And it is misconstrued by the channeler uh, what information is actually coming through. And sometimes that causes the information to change. Let me explain. That many times the person that's the channel hears something quite differently in their head than what is trying to be said by whoever is speaking and so the message will come out in a very different way because the mind of the channeler has changed it because they cannot actually comprehend or do not uh, understand where the information is coming from or why they are communicating it so therefore it is best to be uh, uninvolved in your channeling as possible to let the purest form of the message come through even if you don't seem to uh, always understand what it is the message will come through and come out as close as possible to the original message if you let it go now it's very difficult for it to be perfect because many of the words and phrases from other languages are not the same to earth people as they are to aliens we had much difficulty at first communicating exactly what we meant because it would be changed your sentences you thought we were meaning this and you let it come out as that We've learned how to control that a little bit better now, but it is still one of the great reasons why there's so much adverse information on your planet. 
And some things are coming through encrypted as well. And this can be a problem. I completely understand. Thank you. Thank you for that. How is then if a, okay, so I understand what you're saying. So then how is that relationship um, developed as far as how have you and we co-created who will give and take this information? Was this done on a, on a contract higher level? Yes. In some fashion. Yes. There are, those that will get to the entire world. And then there are those that will not because they cannot channel properly. They will be what you call a flash in the pan. They will start to channel, they will gain an audience, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Why? Because they were taken away, because the messages coming through were not what were meant to be, and so they had to be stopped. Now they will not be killed or anything of this nature, but they're just their message will will be uh, stopped because it is against what we are trying to do. It's against what all or ninety percent of the aliens and species out here are trying to communicate. So therefore, you have seen that some people have started but never continued. Okay, now, I there understand. are some that have negative controls on them, and they will continue because they have those negative controls, and their messages will be dark, and they will be foreboding, and they will... And it may be even true that some of these things are true, that there will be negativities coming, and this, this, and that, and the other thing. However, when we put out a message from here, we want a positive slant to it so that it may come into the, onto the planet in a positive as possible way, even though it may not be a, a positive message, so that people may use it in a positive way and not use it for darkness or for negativity or for anything other than what it was intended to be used for. I understand. There is, much, there is much problem right now with channeling on your planet. But those that are of a good nature and true will continue. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and I, I know that there, there are many of us who that is just simply our desire is to, to bring through the most pure message. Absolutely. From all of you. If someone sends out an intention that they wish to communicate with your species um, um, what, telepathically or through channeling, how do you receive that information? Do you receive that telepathically from us? In we, have certain, we have certain technology that can pick up empathic thought processes and mind wave uh, things. If their thought process is strong enough to get onto these particular monitors, are strong enough to activate them and make and let us hear them, then they are worth for us to give them a chance to channel. Thank you. I, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, I'm not sure there if we had... that will. I'm sorry, but oh, there no, are okay. those that wish. There are those that will wish to channel all their lives, but their frequencies are not open far enough for us to get through in a valuable way. So therefore, it would be impossible for us to help them. They may be picked up by someone else, but for us, we're looking for certain um, positive vibrational channels. I, was, I understand, and that was what I was gonna ask you was, is I guess it really just boils down to frequency. It does. I understand. Um, I think that was everything that I was really wanting to ask. If I missed it, um, I did want to ask, um, do you have, or do you keep the same partner throughout your, your time? Do you have more than one um, partner? Do you, you know, how, how do you? We are permitted to have more than one partner. If you can have one partner, it is a sign of great, um loyalty to keep just one 
you are allowed to have on our planet and in our in our world you are allowed to have as many as three at one time but those that are most well respected only have one at this point i need to interrupt uh jim jim's time well, go right ahead, Max. yeah yep Thank you all. Uh, it was a wonderful discussion. There is tons more to discuss. Like we didn't discuss the religion, spiritual life, the galactic um, th life, and and things of that sort. And involvement. Well, I hope you learned a lot from this. Yes. I certainly enjoyed speaking to you. Thank and you very much. Drawings, Khan, you're amazing. This is a light being from Sirius. There is one more question from Khan. Uh, you, you asked about. Uh, orange and blue Arcturians. Did you get their yeah. names? Did they provide their subspecies names? Ah, their subspecies names. The pink one, well, if you really want me to tell you, you probably will not remember them. We are recording. The pink one is Desafepondia. Desafepondia. Desafem, yes. You said it correctly, I think. And the blue I A at the end. This a lot pondia. This a film Plumbia. Well there that spelling is incomplete. We'll have to go back to the recording and reconstruct it. And the second but, one. Or attendee. That one's much easier. Say again. Or attendee. Or attendee. Thank you much. O R E T N D I. Yes, that's correct. Or attendee. At this point, I have to close. Thank you very much. And let's continue when we have the next opportunity. Wonderful. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you, Jakar. Yep, so Greetings, fine. and you, what? Uita alkochi, tere ambashote. Namaste, yes. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>